Are you ready to worship God? Awesome. If you are able, please stand. We're going to worship our God. Before we worship, I just want to say Merry Christmas to all of you. All right. Feliz Navidad. I'm 
You have led me through the fire in darkest night. You were close like no other. I know you as a father. I know you as a friend. Cause I have been in the goodness of God. to welcome uh, Daniels and Maui on the stage. Thank you. Merry Christmas, everyone. This is my first time to stand in, your, in front of here, so I'm a little bit nervous. <laughs> <laughs> and I have a shaky a little bit my knee and I, I, my hand too. <laughs> so I could be something wrong in my wrist. Please understand me in, in Jesus' name. Thank you very much. This event, we have used the roots and its candles to help us to prepare our hearts to celebrate the birth of Christ. When we lit the first purple candle, we ask us to come be our hope. God, our hope, has come in Jesus Christ. When we lit the second purple candle, we remember God who is love. God loved us so much. He brought Jesus Christ to take our sin and die upon the cross. 
so that we might be forgiven. When we lit the dark pink candle, we feel joyful even in our longing for Christ to come. Christ, who has been born in a major and will come again in glory to wipe away every tear for our eyes. When we lit the fourth candle, we remember that God's peace will fill the earth through Christ, who came as a son, the son of Mary, the son of David, and the son of God. His son has been born. He is Emmanuel. God with us, this evening, we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ, Jesus our hope, Jesus who loves us, Jesus who brings our joys, Jesus who brings unending peace, Jesus who will come again, the very Son of God. Too often, people focus on the livestock and furniture around the Christmas season. They want to know which animals, where they end, what kind of the furniture the baby Jesus lay in. But what if we were to look at the Christmas message by not going to the Gospel of Matthew, although it is wonderful and truth, but by going back to the Gospel of John, in the Gospel, John writes, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was good, and the Word was God. And in verses 14, it says, and the work become fresh and joy among us. Thank you very much. Too often, followers of Christ get caught up in the furniture and lifestyle of the event to extend that they lose sight of the power of the miracle of God sending his son to our world to see save us from sin and give us hope and light. A first step towards helping us better proclaim Jesus is to not get caught up in all trappings that surround the miracle, but instead to look to the miracle itself. The miracle itself is that God, who has always existed as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, sent his Son and that his son become flesh and joy among us. This is incarnation God among us. In the incarnation, we understand the death of God's love, but also the passion for God's mission. For Jesus says to us, as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. During this season of celebrating Christ coming to earth, when we consider evangelism, it starts with remembering that just as God sent Jesus, so Jesus sends us. And now we are on a mission of his name and film. John chapter 1 verse 5 says, The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The incarnation has given us a mission of pointing those in darkness to the light of Christ. The question is, will we focus on this mission or will we get caught up in the lifestyle and furniture? We light this candle with great joy and celebration because Christ is born in Bethlehem. God's Son has come into the world to be our Savior, and He will come again in glory. Let us pray. Lord, the miracle of God among us has given us a mission greater than any other. Give us opportunity daily to show and share the light and love of Jesus so that many will turn their heart to you. Amen. I need to opening prayer. So before prayer, uh, Sunday school kid, second grade and younger, free and go. Let's pray. Sit down, Java. So, Jimmy Depa, Jesu Dene, Tayare, Mingla, Shire, Nima, Igedo, Goropia, Munit, Omyako, Jimba, Bualunga, 
ยงจิตุมะกุสุยงสิมะปะพยายะเนกุรกุภูมิโยขวัญเนกุรกุโกโกขวัญยะโลนามะรอทุเวชิมอมะตะชินอวุณพยาอตุปาชิรอมุบาย
snowing. <laughs> Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for another Christmas season, a time when we can come together and look with expectant joy to the celebration of the birth of your coming Son. And Lord, I thank you that we live at a time when that's in the past and we get to celebrate it. And I pray that you would speak through me today, that we would leave here changed and a little bit more in awe of you, a little bit more trusting in you, a little bit more understanding your faithfulness. Because as we go into Christmas season, it gets so easy, Lord, to, to get distracted by the things of consumerism and presents and families, Lord. So I pray that we would just settle here tonight, that we would just settle our hearts, that we would be still before you and know that you are God. And I pray that you would speak through your word to us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I want to thank... Uh, Hunky and the worship team, and Maui and Daniel, and the dancers, um, for all that you have brought for this service. I love that we did Feliz Navidad. Um, I got an opportunity a few, a couple weeks ago to go caroling with our uh, Burmese brothers and sisters, and it was super fun when they do, so they love Feliz Navidad, right? Like, that's one of your favorite songs to play, it seems like. And I love it because it's, it's already in two languages, and they'll still start it in Burmese. And so it's, they add this extra language, and it's amazing. It's, it's so fun. They're so filled with joy. I learn a lot from them, and so I'm really thankful that I get to come and open the Word of God in front of so many of you. Well, hey, if you're maybe new to Crosspoint. Maybe you don't know what Crosspoint is because you're staying with family or friends and they're like, hey, listen, the only way you're getting fed is if you come with me to church tonight. So welcome to Crosspoint. Uh, we are a church here in Rockford and we exist to bring about the obedience of the faith for the sake of his name, referring to God, the sake of God's name, among all the nations. So multiculturalism, understanding the diversity that God has brought into this world and so is something to be celebrated and it's something that we take very seriously. I am Michael Allen. I am the associate pastor here. I'm not the, the lead pastor. I'm not the better speaker. Um, so he is going to be speaking tomorrow. Highly recommend you come for that as well. But spoiler alert, it's going to be more or less the same message because this is Christmas season. And we understand that a lot of you have family traditions and rituals and liturgies, if I can use that, that word, that you do every year. And so we're trying to make it an, uh, as possible for you to come and celebrate and worship the coming Jesus in the form of a baby, as well as being able to spend time with family. And we also understand, I don't know if any of you have noticed, how incredibly uh, popular illness is right now. It's, it feels like it's everywhere, right? And, and not, just, not, just, not just COVID, we're allowed to say that one, but like just colds and things. I was a little ill earlier this week. I was a little concerned that I'd be coughing up sputum as I was talking to you all. But the Lord is good, and I am not doing that. So here's what's really fun. We have 365.25 days in a year, right? And if you're like, wait, what's the 0.25? That's why we get a leap year every, every four years, right? Um, so we have 365.25 days in a year. And some of those days we consider more special than others. Sometimes we, we think of, a, of our birthday as being really special. We have a, a member of our congregation, and I won't, I won't say who it is, who celebrates the seven days of this person around their birthday time. <laughs> we celebrate anniversaries, right? Anniversa we celebrate church anniversaries. We celebrate marriage anniversaries. We have significant days that are set aside maybe nationally, things like uh, 4th of July, Memorial Day, President's Day. We have some days that are maybe under-celebrated, right? Like January 21st. Who knows what January 21st is other than Dave? It's Squirrel Appreciation Day, okay? We also have days that are under-observed like May 9th. May 9th is Lost Sock Memorial Day. Full disclosure, I stole that joke from Dave, just so you all know. That was <laughs> but when we come to Christmas time, this day that we set aside every year, maybe for us that's a couple weeks of bouncing between families, but there's the day, tomorrow, this day that we set aside. But it's this whole season. It's when we have 
snow. We have a white Christmas. And we, we're driving down and we see the sun glistening across, uh, against the snow crystals and creating this beautiful landscape. We think of Christmas often as the time of belief. Belief in magic, right? Belief in just this peace. Belief in maybe rest, right? We just passed the long, or I'm sorry, the shortest day of the year, which means we had the longest night. Man, I wish I could have just slept that entire time, right? But Christmas is the time of belief. Belief in things like Santa. See? Belief in things like, let's see how many of you get this before I, I tell you. Belief in, you know, the strong, independent, hardworking businesswoman whose life is devoid of anything until she returns to her small town roots and finds the true meaning of Christmas, usually in the form of a burly guy who she rejected in high school, known as Har- Hallmark movies, right? <laughs> We've got some people. <laughs> That's my sister, y'all. <laughs> when we are believers, when, we are, when we're Christians, when we come together to worship, this is a season where we believe in the miracle that is the birth of the Christ Messiah. And we've been studying through this Advent season, this preparation season, this coming season, what's called the Magnificat, which is this beautiful prayer that Mary prays after she's told that she is going to be giving birth to Jesus. It's filled with praise for God and it's celebrating things like his mercy and his justice and the fulfillment of his promise, which is what we're going to be talking about today. And before we get into it, I want to read it one more time with you. So if you have your Bibles with you or if you grab one from the pew, we're going to turn to Luke chapter 1. If you don't know your Bible very well, that's okay. There's a table of contents in the front. Luke chapter 1. And it starts in verse 46. It says, And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. And the two verses we're going to be looking at today as we conclude this series. He has helped his servant Israel, in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. So when you're studying scripture, it's a really good practice to get into the habit of asking questions as you're processing it. Otherwise, it kind of starts to like, you kind of read it like it's a a novel and you don't really start to connect with it and and this goes deeper. And so Dave and I, Dave and I worked on this message together and and Dave and I came up with these three questions that I think are really, they're pulled kind of right from the text, right? The first is how, how has God helped his servant Israel, right? She says that he does, how has he done that? Why, why did Israel need mercy and how was it fulfilled? And what did he speak to Abraham and to his offspring forever? And what's fun is when you take these, these pieces, these questions that you're asking of Scripture, it'll send you to other places in Scripture as you learn and understand. And I want you to walk away, if you walk away with nothing else tonight, I want you to walk away with, with two words that I'm, I'm hoping will be a challenge for you. It's, it's a little bit um, spiritual in nature, which I know is strange for a pastor to be saying something spiritual. But I want you to, if you only take away two words, I just want you to take away these words. Believe God. Believe God. Okay, we're going to walk through some examples of this in this prayer. So first, believe that God will help his servant. Believe that God will help his servant. We see this right away in, in uh, verse 54. He has helped his servant Israel. And notice the connection to near the start of the prayer, right? Our, our sermon series, he has done great things. He has helped his servant. Our God is an active God. He doesn't stand away in the clouds, fully detached from what's happening. He didn't create a creation and then step off and say, done, I'm out of it. He is active and involved. He has helped his servant. God is faithful to help 
his servant. And the church, us, the global church, has been grafted into and adopted as sons of God, as his chosen people. And can we just point out, you notice that the master is helping the servant? Doesn't that feel backwards? Dave talked about uh, last week, I think, about how this text is not, it's banned in certain countries. And it's banned because it talks about casting down rulers from their thrones. But also, can you imagine this getting into a culture that's based on a master and servant mentality? The master helping the servant? That's insane. Isaiah 41 says, But you, Israel, my servant Jacob, whom I have chosen, the offspring of Abraham, my friend. Just sang a song, right? I've known you as a friend. It says, You whom I took from the ends of the earth and called from its farthest corners, saying to you, You are my servant, and I have chosen you and not cast you off. You're chosen. It says, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, I will help you, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. So he calls his servants, he calls his chosen people his friends. What a friend we have in Jesus, right? Some of you might know that. Soon. He's chosen us. And he promises to be with us through it all. Listen, we get really ramped up sometimes into the joy of the season, right? We get really excited, all the presents and the decorations and the arguments over whether or not we just do all white and silver lights or we do the kind of color vomit lights, which I'm team color vomit personally. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Um, now, in fairness, I also don't actually do the decorating, so my opinion becomes kind of moot at that point. But, <laughs> but let's not pretend that this season isn't sometimes filled with sorrow for people. We have people who are missing family members. They're mourning. My wife and I, we have uh, someone who we know who a year ago, her husband committed suicide around this time. But... God is with us, even in that pain. It doesn't take it away, but he will uphold us with it. And this is the promise that we have in Christ. Because Jesus came down in the form of a servant, Philippians tells us. And then in Luke 24, he says that uh, Jesus says when he leaves, he's sending his spirit, Right? And this is the ever-present spirit of God that gives us access to God's power and strength, his encouragement, his uplifting, his righteous right hand. You are not alone. Even if sometimes it feels like it. Believe God will help his servant. He's promised it. So believe God will help his servant and believe that God will remember his mercy. Now, if you're like me, sometimes I like to play the grammar game, right? And so you might be like, well, did did God forget? Like, did God forget to show mercy? Like, oh, I, I'm supposed to be showing mercy to these guys. My bad. No, right? If you make a promise to somebody, Naomi and I have um, some neighbors across the street who we're, who we're friendly with. <laughs> and if they go out of town, they might send us a message and say, hey, we're going to be going out of town in a couple months. Can you, you know, we have a chewy box or a bark box that's coming and the food is cold and we need somebody to get our mail. Can you, can you take that for us? We say yes, we, we promise that we will take care of that for them. Then in those two months, we haven't forgotten that that promise is, is there. But we remember, well, sometimes we do because we're human, and if we don't put it on a calendar, we forget. But when the time comes to fulfill the promise, we say that we remember it. So God saying he remembers his mercy doesn't have to do with him having forgotten it in some kind of divine moment It says he has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy because it's time for him to fulfill that promise of mercy. What even is mercy? We talked about this a couple weeks ago in more depth, so please head back if you're visiting and didn't hear that and want to learn more about God's mercy. But I really like this definition that that, uh, Louis Burkhoff gives, and he says that mercy may be defined as the goodness or the love of God shown to those who are in misery or distress, irrespective of what they're due. The goodness or love of God shown, made manifest, again, active. He's doing something. Micah uh, 7 
says, as Micah is speaking to and for God, he says, who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. He will again have compassion on us, right? He'll remember his mercy. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. You will show faithfulness to Jacob and, to, uh, and steadfast love to Abraham as you have sworn to our fathers from the days of old. In the book Gentle and Lowly, which if you have not read it, I highly recommend it. Dana Ortland describes how God is provoked to anger numerous times in Scripture. Dozens of times. But never once, not once, do we see him being provoked to love or provoked to mercy. His anger requires provocation, Ortland says. His mercy is pent up, ready to gush forth. That's the God that we worship. When God is describing himself in Exodus 34 as he passes before Moses, he declares, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious. The first two words that God uses to describe himself are that of mercy and that of grace. That's the God that we worship. The psalmist writes this in Psalm 98. He says, he has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. This is the mercy he promises, and it's the mercy he brings forth in the person of Jesus. The great high priest, the king of kings, the joyful salvation from darkness in this world. God promised his mercy to his people. And when the time for the fulfillment of that time, promise came, he remembered and so poured forth God's mercy. So believe God will help his servant and believe God will remember his mercy. And then last, believe that God will keep his word. Believe God is faithful. At the end of this verse, he has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers and, his, and to Abraham and to his offspring forever. God's promise to redeem his creation goes way back to the garden, right? It, it, uh, we see God saying to the serpent that uh, your offspring will crush the serpent's head in Genesis 3. But we see it spoken with a little bit more clarity in Genesis 22. Speaking to Abraham, God says, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gates of his enemies, and in your offspring shall the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. Sometimes I think we forget how limited our view of time is, especially in comparison to God. This promise was made before Rome existed. It was made before crucifixion was a thing. It was made before Mary and Joseph were a twinkle in the eyes of their parents. It was made before any of us, right? But he keeps his faithfulness. He keeps his promise. God is immeasurably patient. And the fruits of the Spirit tell us that if, as we grow in Christ, we too become more patient. How many of you feel like you need some patience this season? Yeah, I know all of your hands should be up if you've ever stood in the line come Christmas time. God is immeasurably patient and he will keep his word. He is faithful. Paul, as he writes to the church in Galatia, says this. He says, now promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say into offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. The fulfillment of God's promise, the moment when he remembered his mercy, is found in Christ. Jesus is the one who possesses the gates of his enemies. Jesus is the way in which nations are blessed. Jesus is who we believe in as the Christ Messiah, born of a virgin, crucified, and resurrected as a declaration of love and mercy undeserved. And this season, we're celebrating the God who emptied himself and came down in the form of a human. We're celebrating that tomorrow. We're celebrating it because it's the mark of God's love for us to redeem his people, to redeem his creation. 2 Corinthians says, For all of God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ with a resounding yes. 
And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. Christ is everything. All of God's promises are fulfilled through Christ. Our salvation, our resurrection from death to life, our strength, our mercy, our helper, our friend, our mighty counselor, the good shepherd, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, the breaker of our chains. Christ, Yeshua, Emmanuel, the God who saves, the God who is with us. That's who we worship. And that's who we're remembering this season. John 3, 16 a lot of you know this verse, it says that God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn it, but in order that the world might be saved through him. All of creation has found its redemption through Christ. You don't get redemption separate from Christ. You can't put him off to the side and say, well, that's good. He was, he was a nice guy, but like, I don't need that. If you want the redemption, you have to go through Christ. I love comparing what we see in the manger to what we see in Revelation. Hear me out. In the manger, we see God coming down in vulnerable human form, God is with us, dwelling in personhood, that he might become the great high priest, tempted in every way as we have been. And then in Revelation 21, we see the new Jerusalem coming down, fully taking its place on a fully redeemed creation, and God the Father coming down and dwelling with us. See, Jesus, God in in the form of Jesus, was was temporarily with us, but he will be eternally with us in the end. And so as you are thinking and praying, celebrating, maybe hurting this season, I want you to believe that God will help his servant. I want you to believe that God will remember his mercy. Believe that he will uh, keep his word. Start with believe God. Start there. Join us in the celebration of the birth of the Messiah. Believe in him who so loved the world that he gave his only son to bring us to God for all of eternity. If you haven't yet turned your heart to that radical help and radical mercy found in the fulfillment of God's promises, what are you waiting for? This is the season to do it. Believe in him, for he has done great things. Merry Christmas. You pray with me? <laughs> Heavenly Father, we, um, we just ask for you to come and do your work in us, Lord. For any of us who are far from you, Lord, I pray that we would lean into you, that we would be willing to wrestle with you, Lord, but that we would start with the belief that we would see you as someone who has been faithful to your promises. And even even those of us who have some pain associated with Christmas, Lord, I pray that we would remember that you are our friend and you are with us and you will uphold us and you will comfort us and you will give us peace. So Lord, I pray for safe travels through the remainder of this Christmas season, I pray for your love to overflow abundantly in your believers. Mostly, Lord, I pray that your name be glorified and honored amongst all of those who are sitting here right now, watching at home, that you, your name will be high and lifted up as we remember, we remember the night that you came. In Jesus' name. So we're going to do Silent Night, and you all hopefully have candles. And I'm going to bring the Christ candle down, and I'm going to start kind of going around to give you guys some lights. Here's what I want you to do. If you have an unlit candle, please be the one to tip your candle to light it. So, for example, if you're like this, you go like this, okay? Otherwise, messes can occur. So I'm going to start over here, and they're going to lead us in Silent Night.
Father, we just um, we just ask that you would open our hearts to the great things that you have done. That we would remember your mercy. That we would remember your faithfulness. Be with us Christmas Eve. Be with us tomorrow. Be with us when we're with family. You will never leave us nor forsake us, Lord. And it's on that that we rest. In Jesus' name. Amen. When you're blowing it out, please be cautious. And then, Fred, are there buckets somewhere? I don't know where Fred is. There are buckets out there? Great. There's buckets for you guys to get rid of them uh, on the cafe. Merry Christmas, everybody. Mm-hmm.